Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. If you're new here, welcome to the podcast, and be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. If you're already a weirdo, please share the podcast with others. Doing so helps make it possible for me to keep doing the podcast. Coming up in this episode… A woman in Scotland has never heard silence. Not because of the noise around her, but because of the noise in her. We've all had a song stuck in our heads, but one woman has had the same song playing on a loop in her brain for the past four years, non-stop. From too much noise to none at all, we'll meet Ezekiel Eads, a man who had no ears and learned to hear the outside world through his mouth. Syphilis is a nasty disease, especially when it eats your nose, but that doesn't mean you can't have a social life, as many noseless have learned from personal experience. Is it possible that it's better to have no nose at all than to have an extremely long one? We'll look at a real-life Pinocchio named Thomas Wetters with a giant proboscis. Imagine living through life with two and a half faces. No, not like a politician, that's simply two-faced. I mean living with two noses and three eyes. You're either an extraterrestrial or you are William Dirks. And what exactly is so alluring about those who cherish virginity? Is it about virtue or is it about something else? While listening, be sure to check out the Weird Darkness website. At WeirdDarkness.com you can sign up for the Weird Dark News email newsletter to win monthly prizes, get Weird Darkness merchandise in the store where 100% of the profits are donated to organizations that help those who struggle with depression. You can visit the Hope in the Darkness page to find help if you're struggling with depression or dark thoughts yourself. You can find paranormal and horror audiobooks I've narrated, watch old horror movies and horror hosts for free 24 hours a day, and find my email address and social media links on the contact page. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the weird darkness. Imagine never knowing the sound of silence. That's what 32-year-old Gemma Cairns goes through every day as she has an extremely rare medical condition that forces her to hear her own blood course through her veins every waking second. According to the Daily Record, Cairns didn't realize this was abnormal until she told her mother about it as a teenager. Cairns desperately tried to find answers for the next 14 years. I've never heard complete silence, she said. I've always had noises. I've always heard my eyes moving and my heartbeat in my head. After years of being prescribed medications for nasal issues and blocked ears, she finally gave up. Only after moving to Glasgow in 2016 did her luck change. After seeing a specialist, she was diagnosed with bilateral superior semicircular canal dehiscence. Cairns is missing part of the temporal bone in both ear canals, which affects both her hearing and her balance. 
she underwent surgery on one ear last September and then the second in October. If successful, this will be the first time in her life that she'll experience complete silence. The lifelong condition plaguing Karen's every movement has been difficult to describe to the people in her life as it is extremely rare and could sound utterly fabricated to some. I've always heard my blood rushing like a swooshing sound, said Cairns, but it's the constant eye movements that have caused her the most trouble. When you do say to someone, I can hear my eyeballs moving, people ask me what it sounds like, and I try to think of so many things that I can describe it with, but just can't tell you a sound that sounds even remotely similar to it. It's not squeaky, but it's similar. It's deep in the back of my head. You get tinnitus with it as well, so there are always noises going on. Kearns has done a remarkable job not letting this overwhelming condition dictate how she lives her life. As a working mother, she gets through the day like everyone else, even if dizziness and constant noise permeate it. I still go to work and things like that, but it affects things like playing with my son. If there are more than a couple of noises going on at once, it can overstimulate me. My ears just can't take it. Sometimes I just want to sit and be quiet and not hear anything, said Cairns. I feel bad saying it because it's not like I'm dying, but it does take its toll, especially when I can't hear as well as everybody else. With some frequencies, I just can't hear at all. I really struggle with deep voices. So what does a typical day for Cairns look like? Besides her inability to function normally in loud environments or dizziness affecting her quality time with her family, the condition has robbed her of regular exercise. I quite like running, but again, it's because when your heart starts to pump faster, it's like pulsating tinnitus and I hear it and feel it, she said. It gets me really dizzy and sometimes I just think it's not worth it, especially at work, and things if I move my head too quickly to one side, it'll knock me off balance and vice versa. Even moving my eyes too quickly will knock me off balance. Luckily, though, her condition has not affected her sleep. Kieran's first surgery corrected the problem in her right ear. Braving the risk of losing her hearing in her left ear, she was ready to double down and get the second operation in October. You can't operate on both at the same time, she said, because it knocks you completely off balance for a while. Karen's has come a long way from feeling constantly drunk and desperately seeking help from doctors who thought she was crazy. After recovering, her final surgery should put an end to her lifelong struggle with this condition. She hopes her story will spur others to keep their heads up. It's a rare condition, she says, but I think it's more undiagnosed than anything else. I think people have it, but they don't know they can get help. Most people say that at one point or another in their lives, they've had a song stuck in their heads. For most, it stops on its own. Some people need to do more to get the song out of their heads. They'll listen to the song until the craving to hum the song dies down. You could also drown out the song with another song. A woman in England had a song stuck in her head one day, and it never left. She tried all the tricks to get it out, but she couldn't, and finally, she turned to doctors to figure out how to get the song out of her head after four long years. Susan Root is from Cogasol, Essex, and worked as a custodian at the Honeywood Community Science School. Because of this, she was already used to auditory overload. She'd often hear doors slamming, bells ringing, and kids talking in the hallways. She was used to those things. In 2013, she began to experience something she couldn't explain. She thought the school started to play the 50s hit faintly, How Much Is That Doggy in the Window, over the loudspeaker. For the 63-year-old Susan, it was a pleasant blast of nostalgia. She loved the Patty Page song when she was growing up. She listened to the song with her mother, and the song reminded her of home. When she mentioned hearing the music to her co-workers, she was shocked to hear that there was no music coming from the loudspeakers. She was told there was no sound at all coming from the PA system. This led Susan to one conclusion. The sound must have been in her head. When Susan got into her car, 
she turned down the radio and still heard the song playing. It started to scare her after a while. Usually when people have a song stuck in their head, it's their own voice that they hear singing it. For Susan, it was Patty Page's voice, and she went home to tell her husband about the songs in her head. When she tried to speak to her husband, she became frustrated because she could barely hear what her husband was saying. The song in her head was so loud it was drowning out his voice. Throughout her life, Susan always had trouble with her ears. She suffered from chronic ear infections, a perforated eardrum, and had balance issues. She had to have surgery twice for ear issues and assumed that the singing in her head was just another ear issue she had to deal with. Years passed, and Susan still heard the song. Day after day, night after night, Susan heard the song. Over the years, she did find some relief. Eventually, the song was replaced by other songs that brought Susan back to her childhood. A few of the songs that she heard included God Save the Queen, Happy Birthday, Somewhere Over the Rainbow, and Auld Lang Syne. Susan tried everything to make the music stop. She'd play white noise in the background when she tried to sleep, like waves crashing, wind whistling, or whale calls. None of it helped, and Susan would lie awake at night, praying it would stop. It was driving her crazy. Finally, Susan couldn't take it anymore, and she went to the doctor. She was diagnosed with tinnitus. The condition occurs when you hear a sound that seems to be generated externally, but only you can hear it. In most cases, it's a ringing in the ears, but Susan's case was much more extreme. They also said it could be musical hallucinations, which are short fragments of simple melodies often mistaken for real music. According to experts, only 1% of tinnitus cases cause musical hallucinations. The doctors believed that her symptoms were a symptom of hearing loss, which was why she couldn't understand her husband. To help treat her condition, Susan's doctors gave her a hearing aid. Unfortunately, it didn't work, and Susan accepted the fact that she'd have this condition forever. She lived with the condition for four years. Her friends would laugh when she told them about her condition, but they didn't understand that for Susan, it was hell. Finally, she had hope that she might be able to quiet the song. She also heard about Gemma Cairns and the surgery that she underwent. Gemma's case gave Susan hope that she might be treated too. Since Susan's condition, however, did not begin at birth, it's unlikely that she was born without the bone that Gemma was. However, Gemma's case does give the doctors answers to some questions. They began checking her inner ear for the solution, and hopefully, they'll find a solution for Susan as well. From Charles Tripp, the armless wonder, and Eli Bowen, the legless acrobat, to Violetta, the trunk woman, and Prince Randian, the living torso, sideshows have provided wealth, fame, and friendships for people born without arms, legs, or no limbs whatsoever. But the man without ears was one act that never took the stage. Ezekiel Eads of Athens, New York, was born in the early 19th century with no ears, not even an opening where the ears should have been. An 1892 article described the unusual character. His deformity, sad as it was, may be said to have been partly alleviated by the curious construction of the inner portion of his head, which enabled him to hear common conversation through his mouth. When addressed, he would instantly open his mouth and readily give answers to interrogations put to him in an ordinary tone of voice. But Ezekiel's lack of ears was not his only distinction. He had a heavy crop of black hair spotted with white the spots themselves being in the exact shape of human ears, feet, hands, etc. When he was quite a small baby, it was noticed that his black hair was interspersed with oddly shaped spots of white, which, however, did not take on their distinctive shapes until after he passed his 15th year. When Mr. Eads died, he left one son, aged 45, whose hair was as black as coal, not a single gray hair being discernible, and another son, 13 years of age, whose hair was as gray as that of a man of 70. 
Eads passed away in 1884 at the age of 65. Little else is known about the man. Although he never joined sideshows or exhibited himself in a dime museum, his story did catch the attention of Robert Ripley, the Believe It or Not cartoonist featured him in one of his books, giving the earless man a sliver of immortality. We now move down the human body ever so slightly to the nose. You may have seen The Nick on Cinemax, which takes place in the year 1900. It features a woman with a prosthetic nose who undergoes a surgical procedure in an attempt to rebuild the proboscis with flesh from the arm. Or perhaps you've read or heard of Lindsay Fitzharris's The Butchering Art, which briefly discusses a no-noses club in London. So let's take a closer look into all of this noselessness. According to The Secret History of London Clubs from 1709, a merry gentleman who called himself Mr. Crumpton assembled a group of flat-faced people in a club that met once a month. This benefactor of the no-nose community began the club after observing an abundance of both sexes had sacrificed to the god Priapus and had unluckily fallen into the fashion of flat faces. But rather than see them spread all over town, why not help them congregate in one glorious nose-free location? Surely they'd appreciate each other's company, and what an amusing scene it would be. The gentleman pleased himself with an opinion. It must prove a comical sight for so many maimed lechers, sniffling old stallions, young unfortunate whoremasters, poor scarified bods, and salivated weststones to shoo their scandalous visards in one noseless society to accomplish which he made in his business for some time the stroll about the town, on purpose to pick acquaintance with all such stigmatized strumpets and fornicators as he thought might be proper members of the smithling community, pretending something or other that would carry a face of interest to all that he talked with, appointing every one apart to him at the Dog Tavern in Drury Lane upon a certain day, a little before dinner time, that they might eat a bit together, and he would then acquaint them with the secret. As they arrived and the crowds grew, they stared at each other in wonder and confusion, as if every sinner beheld their own iniquities in the faces of their companions. At dinner, the chefs preparing the feast got their creative juices flowing. Keeping with the theme of the evening, they cut the snouts off of the pigs being served. The gentleman being offered to see the pigs' heads so strangely mangled sent for the cook upstairs to know the reason of it who answered he had cut off their snouts to put the pigs in the fashion, for he thought it not fit for two such squeamish creatures to run their unmannerly of the no-nose club. Twenty-five noses into such good company that had but one amongst them. Following dinner, the merriment continued with drinks, and for once in their lives it was as if their sins were their pride and their sufferings their glory. Sadly, such festivities came to an end after a year's time when Mr. Crumpton passed away. His noseless friends gave the following eulogy at his funeral. Mourn for the loss of such a generous friend, whose lofty nose no humble snout disdained, but though of Roman height could stoop so low as to soothe those who ne'er a nose could show. Ah, sure, no noseless club could ever find one single nose so bountiful and kind, but now, alas, he has sunk into the deep where neither kings or slaves a nose shall keep, but where proud beauties, strutting bow and all, must soon into the noseless fashion fall. Tither your friend in complacence is gone, to have nose like yours reduced to none. Now a short story about a long nose. Geppetto's wooden puppet Pinocchio was cursed with a nose that grew every time he told a lie. Had he been a real boy, his nose would have known only one rival from the pages of history, that of Thomas Wetters. Wetters, who lived in the early 18th century, had a schnoz that reportedly measured seven and a half inches long, or if you prefer the metric system, 19 centimeters such a nose would be considered an extreme case of hypertrophy. 
According to George Gould and Walter Pyle's 1896 book, Anomalies and Curiosities of Medicine, Wetters exhibited his extraordinary nose through Yorkshire. The Strand Magazine, Volume 11, also from 1896, expanded on Gould and Pyle's account. Thus, if noses were ever uniformly exact in representing the importance of the individual, this worthy ought to have amassed all the money in Threadneedle Street and conquered all Europe, for this prodigious nose of his was a compound of the acquisitive with the martial. But either his chin was too weak or his brow too low, or nature had so exhausted herself in the task of giving this prodigy a nose as to altogether forget to endow him with brains, or perhaps the nose crowded out this latter commodity. At all events, we're told this Yorkshireman expired, nose and all, as he had lived, in a condition of mind best described as the most abject idiocy. Today, Wetter's beak is still stared at in the form of a waxwork at Ripley's Believe It or Not auditoriums. There you can decide to believe his nose was as big as advertised, or that the passing of time exaggerated its length, making this tale as fictional as Pinocchio. Up next, we've covered ears, no ears, noses, and no noses. Now imagine life with two noses and three eyes. It's the true story of William Dirks, the man with two and a half faces. Plus, we move further down the human body to below the waist and look at virgins, the history of testing for virginity and curing it if it has been given away. Sometimes you feel a bit nutty, especially if you're a weirdo. If that feeling transfers to your taste buds as well, I've got some great news for you. Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy Coffee. Wrap your taste buds around this medium dark roast blend with shrouds of almond, honey, and chocolate. Each bag of Nutty Mummy is exclusive to Weird Darkness and is roasted to order, then bandaged, I mean bagged, specifically for you to ensure maximum freshness for you, your mummy, and anyone else you share it with. Entomb your old coffee and bring your taste buds back from the dead with Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. William Dirks was known as the man with two noses and three eyes. He was born in 1913 in northern Alabama with a hair lip and grew up on a farm without an education. Adding to his misfortune, Dirks suffered from frontal nasal dyplasia, which worsened his cleft palate by creating a cleft through his entire face. This gave the impression of two noses and a third eye socket. In the book American Sideshow, Author Mark Hartzman writes of how showman Ward Hall described the poor man as looking like he'd been hit in the face with an axe. Dirks left the farm by the age of 14 and began exhibiting his most unusual face in sideshows and later at Hubert's Museum in New York City. In Arthur Lewis's book Carnival, Dirks said, "...none of the kids or teachers could ever look at me, and my mom and pop didn't have no money to give me for a private education, so what could I do?" To add to his bizarre look, he painted a third eye in the gap between his real ones. By the 1960s, he was earning as much as $100 a week. Aside from finding a livelihood on stage, the two-nosed man also found love and married Mildred the Alligator-Skinned Woman. In hearing of this story, you might also be reminded of the story of Edward Mordrake, the man with a face on the back of his head. If you watched American Horror Story Freak Show, you heard about Edward Mordrake and his demon face that sat on the back of his skull. The show went on to describe how Mordrake joined a sideshow and eventually killed everyone in it before taking his own life and then haunting sideshows every Halloween. Mordrake was based off the story of Edward Mordake, no second R, who dates back to the late 19th century. George Gould and Walter Pyle wrote about Mordake 
in their 1896 book Anomalies and Curiosities of Medicine, saying, The following well-known story of Edward Mordake, though taken from lay sources, is of sufficient notoriety and interest to be mentioned here. One of the weirdest as well as most melancholy stories of human deformity is that of Edward Mordake, said to have been heir to one of the noblest peerages in England. He never claimed the title, however, and committed suicide in his 23rd year. He lives in complete seclusion, refusing the visits even of members of his own family. He was a young man of fine attainments, a profound scholar, and a musician of rare ability. His figure was remarkable for its grace, and his face, that is to say his natural face, was that of an, an antinous. But upon the back of his head was another face, that of a beautiful girl, lovely as a dream, hideous as a devil. The female face was a mere mask, occupying only a small portion of the posterior part of the skull, yet exhibiting every sign of intelligence of a malignant sort, however. It would be seen to smile and sneer while Mordake was weeping. The eyes would follow the movements of the spectator, and the lips would gibber without ceasing. No voice was audible, but Mordek averes that he was kept from his rest at night by the hateful whispers of his devil twin, as he called it, which never sleeps, but talks to me forever of such things as they only speak of in hell. No imagination can conceive the dreadful temptations it sets before me. For some unforgiven wickedness of my forefathers I am knit to this fiend, for a fiend it surely is. I beg and beseech you to crush it out of human semblance, even if I die for it." Such were the words of the hapless Mordake to Manvers and Treadwell, his physicians. In spite of careful watching, he managed to procure poison, whereof he died, leaving a letter requesting that the demon face might be destroyed before his burial, lest it continues its dreadful whisperings in my grave. At his own request, he was interred in a waste place without stone or legend to mark his grave. Of course, there's no mention as to who their lay sources were, so was this account of Mordake from a medical book fact or fiction? The Museum of Hoax's site seems to have uncovered the answer, and they found an article titled The Wonders of Modern Science, Some Half-Human Monsters Once Thought to Be of the Devil's Brood, in an 1895 issue of the Boston Sunday Post, with the exact story Gould and Pyle printed. It was printed by a poet named Charles Lowton Hildreth. Fiction, presented as nonfiction. It may have fooled Gould and Pyle, but ultimately their coverage gave Mordake, or Mordrake, life that lasted longer than Hildreth could ever have imagined. Virginity has been the obsession of men for thousands of years. It has driven the best of people like the virgin warrior Joan of Arc to fight for just cause. Virginity has also lured the worst people, such as the sadistic Countess Elizabeth Bathory, to cause the murder of virgin maidens in order to bathe in their blood, or so the history books tell us. But why? What exactly is so alluring about those who cherish virginity? Is it about virtue? or is it about something else? Though virginity no longer defines the commodious value of women, around the world the controversial belief in virgin cure myths involving sex with a virgin to be cleansed of sexually transmitted diseases and virgin testing the inspection of the existence of the hymen continue. In Han Blanc's book Virgin – The Untouched History, virginity tests shared three consistent characteristics. They looked for measurements, they referenced cultural myth and the latest notions of science, and they made sure the woman being inspected had no say. But how could all of these things be for the oppression and the commoditization of women? In order to understand how virgin tests have come to be, one must first understand the origins of virginity and why obsession with it has remained prevalent in the modern world. With the rise of agriculture some five to 10,000 years ago, depending on the region, it's believed the concept of giving importance to virginity arose due to a father's need to commoditize his daughter for the continuation of an agricultural society. 
This was known as the paternity-slash-property hypothesis, which placed virgin women as material property. Their purpose was to become pregnant, raise children, and make sure the paternal family line continued. By creating the concept of virginity, a father could assure the family of the groom that there were no children from other males. Some of the earliest accounts about virginity come from Egypt, Greece, Rome, and early Christianity. From these sources, it's clear to see the cultural development into what it is currently. Virginity did not carry universal definitions. Often, the concept of virginity was synonymous with chastity. However, chastity and virginity could have meant two different things in pre-Christian societies. In some instances, celibacy was not essential for marriage. According to Douglas and Teeter, ancient Egypt during the New Kingdom, 1570 BC and 1544 BC, did not see virginity as essential in order to be married. It is assumed that sexual intercourse was socially acceptable during this time. However, once married, both couples were expected to be exclusively monogamous. Famed Greek historian Herodotus in 450 BC mentioned the virgin testing with the Amazons of Scythia. According to historical accounts, whose accuracy have not been verified, Scythian Amazon girls were not considered women until they had killed a man in battle. Only then could they be regarded as pure and ready for marriage, and that if no man was killed, the girl would remain a virgin. In this sense, virginity meant the purity of value as opposed to having an intact hymen. In fact, virginity in the ancient world might have referred to whether a woman was married or single. In another example, Herodotus depicted another virginity test in the festival of Ibia, modern Tunisia, involving several chariots driving young maidens divided into two groups armed with sticks and stones. These women would fight to the death. Those who died were considered non-virgins, and those who survived would be virgins and ready for marriage. However, other Greek accounts would give different perspectives to the definition of virginity. According to Han Blank, it was common for a father to murder his daughter if she was caught losing her virginity before marriage. In ancient Greece, a daughter's role was her worth in marriage. Marriage was a legally binding contract between two families to gain power, land, reputation, and peace. The total value of a woman depended on her virginity. In another example, the Cretan Legal Code from 450 BC stated the value of virginity in women as a very crucial commodity for marriage. The Cretan penalties for rapes of virgins were far more severe than the rapes of non-virgins. The rapist of a female household serf would be fined at two staters if the serf in question had been a virgin and only one obel, essentially a slap on the wrist if she had not. Blank, Hahn, 2007. The Cretan laws about rape essentially forced the rapist to pay reparations to the husband, father, or slave owner, conveying the perspective that a woman was viewed as mere property. Ancient physicians used instruments such as the speculum, a duck-billed widening contraption, in order to inspect a woman's gynecological health. However, as Judeo-Christian beliefs became more prevalent, the fear of ruining the hymen by such an instrument became a significant worry. Due to the fear of being seen as a sexual deviant, many gynecologists devised alternate methods for examining the sexual organs by inserting their fingers into the rectum of a woman rather than the vagina in order to check the uterus and ovaries. This method was considered more clinical and safer in preserving the hymen. The Spanish Roma Gypsy people believed in a virginity test called gitanos. This was the belief that a grape-like gland existed in the vagina and that it contained a yellowish liquid called the uva, or juice. When this gland was pressed, the fluid was expelled, resulting in the end of a woman's virginity. The process was called the loss of honra, or the honor. This test was performed only in the ceremonial defloration of a bride. Members of both sides of the family would come to watch the first act of copulation in order to see both blood and honra stains on the sheets. This act was considered an occasion for witness, pride, and celebration. Another aspect towards virginity slowly took shape among early Christianity. The Christian virgin martyr legends spoke of chaste women waging wars against demons in order to protect their pact with God. 
However, a dangerous belief slowly developed from these legends that the strength of a Christian virgin woman could be strong enough to defeat sexually transmitted diseases. This belief, unfortunately, would cause some of the worst crimes of sexual abuse prominent to this day. During the 1200s, the De Secretis Mulierum, the Woman's Secrets, was a manual designed to identify a woman's chastity through her demeanor. It was written for physicians to rely on physical signs that would not involve touching the vagina. In the De Secretis Mulierum, it stated, shame, modesty, fear, a faultless gait and speech, casting eyes down before men, the urine of virgins is clear and lucid, sometimes white, sometimes sparkling. However, the notion of clear urine still seemed to be the main factor in both the Spanish Roba Gypsies as well as many other European cultures of the Middle Ages. By 1625, gynecologists became more prevalent and even earned the title of men midwives. Though the examination of female genitalia was starting to become more frequent, it was still considered to be a disrespectable act. In 1810 France, prostitution was legalized and regulated. The new laws required that each registering prostitute needed a speculum exam to check for venereal diseases. Student doctors from all regions of Europe, as well as the United States, flooded Paris for a chance to study the medical definitions of what a prostitute's vagina looked like via the speculum vaginal examination technique. In response to this, the need for virgin tests might have been due to the mandatory genital examinations performed by registering French prostitutes. By the late 19th century, the speculum became known as a violating tool, encouraging an unwanted intrusion into the vagina. Physicians feared that further use of the speculum would awaken a sexual appetite, resulting in nymphomania or even hysteria. Because of this fear, alternative methods for medical virgin testing became necessary to maintain the honor of women, especially virgins. One method mentioned by Mary Roach, the writer of Bonk, who wrote about gynecologist Robert Latow Dickinson's discussion of alternative methods for checking a woman's virginity in 1910. The volume of the virgin vagina is one finger, the married woman rates it two fingers. Once the babies started coming out, it's three fingers and up. As noted by the early 20th century, the controversial beliefs of the times led most gynecological physicians to return to physical methods of touch only if necessary. By the late 19th century, the cure for syphilis and other venereal diseases had one medical option – to inject the infected urethra with heated mercury to burn out the infection. Such treatments were extremely humiliating as well as painful for those who went through the procedure. There was, however, the growing virgin cure myth – a belief that sexual intercourse with a virgin could cure all diseases. This myth became so prevalent that brothels in the 19th century would advertise having both young and disabled virgins available for paying customers. Though it was previously mentioned that virgin cure myths might have originated from stories of virgin martyrs in early Christendom, other scholars believe it developed from the uneducated observation of the STD symptoms stages. When the symptoms, such as sores, blisters, or discharges would eventually disappear after several acts of sexual intercourse with different women, the suspicion was that one of those women may have been a virgin. Therefore, to a non-educated person, sex with a virgin was the cure. Virgin cures became so problematic that early 20th century British lawyers and judges found it difficult when attempting to prosecute cases involving child sexual assault. A case study from Glasgow in 1913 in which Robert James C., a 37-year-old coal miner, was being charged with the rape of his nine-year-old niece with the additional charge of transmitting gonorrhea to her. This case led the Crown Council into an investigation revealing that commoners throughout England, Scotland, and other regions of Western Europe believed in the virgin cure myth. According to scholar Roger Davidson, in the early 20th century, one in every five child rape cases in London had to do with the myth of the virgin cure. This was so rampant that many child rapists used the virgin curing myth as a legitimate defense in court. This myth, unfortunately, continues to wreak havoc in some cultures even still today. Though people are more educated about the spread of sexually transmitted diseases, the virgin cure myth currently maintains influence in Africa 
Egypt, and other former European colonial countries. As with the virgin cure myth, virginity tests are also still in practice in many other countries as well. Many countries continue to implement virginity for social, political, and or cultural reasons. In 2003, in Jamaica, the Jamaican parliament proposed to initiate virginity tests for all Jamaican girls in order to prevent unplanned pregnancies, as opposed to sex education classes. In regions of Afghanistan, tests are often done without the consent of the women. In other countries, such as Egypt and Iran, there are still physicians who engage in the virginity test. With the changing of the times, it's crucial to bring up the traumas brought forth by both the virginity test and the virgin cure myth. As with the controversial effects of colonialism, the spread of the virgin cure myth has caused much damage to places such as regions all over Africa. The belief of virgin curing has caused AIDS to spread throughout the continent. Child virgin rape, as well as the violation of disabled girls, continues to grow. The shift from child virgins to disabled virgin rape might have grown due to the lack of legal protection. Most rape cases involving disabled victims are usually dismissed due to their inability to report rape, and the fear of misunderstanding often leaves their testimony to be untrustworthy. Because of this, there are many sexual offenders that remain unpunished. Throughout history, the urge for the protection of a woman's virginity, though seemingly for the honor of females, has inevitably never been for the benefit of women. Historically, the security and examination of virginity were designed to commoditize women for trade, reproduction, and the curing of sexual diseases. If there's any emphasis to be made, it's that women indeed had no say. In later years, the greatest tragedy to virginity is that medical physicians have claimed time and time again that virginity testing was morally and ethically wrong for the sole fact that there is no proven medical way to test for it. But even with this information, there are still many countries such as Africa, Europe, America, and Asia which still believe in the necessity for virgin tests as well as the healing powers of the virgin cure myth. Thanks for listening. If you want to help the podcast, be sure to subscribe if you haven't already done so, and leave a review of the show in the podcast app you listen from. But more important than anything, please share the podcast, tell someone about it. Someone who loves paranormal stories, true crime, monsters, or mysteries like you do. Do you have a dark tale to tell of your own? Fact or fiction, click on Tell Your Story on the website and I might use it in a future episode. All stories in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find source links or links to the authors in the show notes. Never a Moment of Silence was written by Marco Margaritoff for all that's interesting. The Earworm is from Faxverse. And The Man with No Ears, The No Noses Club, A Short Story About a Long Nose, and Two and a Half Faces were all written by Mark Hartsman for Weird Historian. Weird Darkness is a production of Marler House Productions. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Psalm 90 verse 12 Teach us to number our days aright, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. And a final thought. The past cannot be changed. The future is yet in your power. Mary Pickford I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness. Her second surgery should put an end to her lifelong struggle with this condition. After recovery, her after recovering, her upcoming after her re after recovering, her final surgery should put an end to her lifelong struggle with this condition. Began the club after observing an abundance of both sexes and sa an abundance of both sexes had sacrificed to the god Priapus. Right. Both sexes had sacrificed to the god Priapus and had unluckily such a nose would be considered an extreme case of hypertrophy. 
Such a nose would be considered an extreme case of hyper. Such a nose would be considered an extreme case of hyper hypertrophy. Such a nose would be considered an extreme case of hypertrophy. Hey, weirdos! Now through June 20th, everything in the Weird Darkness store is up to 35% off. That means huge savings on everything in the store, with t-shirts only 16 bucks. And now, long last, we have hats. Trucker hats and dad hats are now available in the store. And those are on sale, too. Start shopping at WeirdDarkness.com slash store, and then click on All Designs to see the full list of designs and products. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash store, then click on All Designs. Remember, the sale ends June 20th. WeirdDarkness.com slash store, and then click on All Designs. Hey, Weirdos! Our next Weirdo Watch Party is this coming Friday, June 21st. Let nothing stop you. And this time it's a double feature. What a terrible thing. This Friday, Bobby Gamonster presents The Vampire's Ghost from 1954, where a bar owner who is a vampire is tired of living as a vampire. Vampire. And will also be treated to 1961's The Snake Woman, in which a doctor tries to cure his wife's sick mind by injecting her with snake venom, and she gives birth to a very creepy daughter. But that's not possible. That's why it's a horror movie. The fun starts early at 4.30 p.m. Pacific, 7.30 p.m. Eastern. Watch one movie, then… Don't move a muscle. Stay for the second movie. It's a Weirdo Watch Party double feature. You're one of the nicest people I've ever known. Well, thank you very much. Our Weirdo Watch Party is always free to watch online, so grab your popcorn, candy, and soda, and jump into the fun and even get involved in the live chat as we watch the show. You will never speak of this. Never. No, actually, you need to tell everyone about this. It's a lot of fun. It's The Vampire's Ghost and The Snake Woman double feature brought to us by horror host Bobby Gamonster. You're seeing a creature that doesn't exist. Oh, he, he totally exists. I've seen him before. And he's a lot of fun. So join us on the Monster Channel page this Friday, June 21st at 4.30 p.m. Pacific, 7.30 p.m. Eastern. We'll see you then.